I just finished watching The Game Changers and I think it was the best vegan documentary I have ever seen. And no, that's not just because it's the only vegan documentary I've ever seen. It's because the production was incredible. The use of footage from professional sporting events, interviews with world-class athletes, tests performed by renowned physicians, illustrative graphics, global destinations, and the inclusion of the most famous host of The Celebrity Apprentice all combined to make a very compelling reason for why you should go vegan. I was momentarily hypnotized by this film. Fortunately for me, the illusion was broken the moment that Dr. Eggplant pulled out his cock. There's a model of a penis. It's not just because I'm a little suspicious of someone named Dr. Spitz that's this comfortable being filmed around a penis. It's because unless they're using Snapchat, most men will generally avoid ejaculating on camera. Let's put it this way. Which scenario seems more likely to triple your erections? A, switching the meat in your burrito to fake meat for one meal, or B, you went a day without ejaculating because Dr. Spitz was recording your boners? My guess is that option A would lead more men to veganism and more ED companies to bankruptcy. I am not opposed to a vegan diet. I followed one myself for three weeks and saw some pretty positive results. What I am opposed to are people who ignore facts to evangelize their lifestyle. Even though I heard Joe Rogan say, A debunking of one of these films will get l way less views right. than the, the actual film itself. That's yeah. just how it goes. Nobody's going to watch. I will take on that task. I have been testing diets on YouTube for years now and feel somewhat obligated to illuminate some of the half-truths mentioned in this film starting with their claims about athletic performance. On March 5th, 2016, the 145 pound UFC champion Conor McGregor was scheduled to fight the 155 pound champion Rafael Dos Anjos, which I am probably pronouncing wrong. This was a huge moment for the UFC because it was only the second time in history that a title holder moved up a weight class to fight for his second belt. Unfortunately for everyone, Dos Anjos broke his foot, which forced him to drop out of the fight with less than two weeks remaining until the event. Losing this fight would be a financial disaster for the UFC. So they offered vegan fighter Nate Diaz a huge purse to take the fight, which he happily accepted. The problem for Connor was that the fight would take place at 170 pounds two full weight classes above his normal fighting weight. The documentary strongly implies that Nate won because he's a vegan. Eat your vegetables. But while Nate was cutting weight for the fight, Connor was gaining to fight 30 pounds heavier than usual. The implication that Connor lost because he ate steaks while Nate ate vegetables seems a little disingenuous when you consider the fact that he was training to fight a different opponent at a lighter weight. Nine days out from the fight, I started eating two steaks a day and it just came back to bite me on the ass. And they also forgot to mention that Connor beat Nate less than six months later. The framing of this fight already had me questioning the integrity of this film's claims about athletic performance, but when I heard Joe say, Nate Diaz is not a vegan. Nate Diaz eats fish and he eats eggs. I think what he does is avoids red meat. The film's credibility took a serious hit. And that's just the beginning of it. The documentary features players on the Tennessee Titans who follow a vegan diet. Despite only making the playoffs once and having a losing record for four of the six years preceding this film, these guys are held up as pillars of athletic accomplishment. Which, to be fair, compared to me, they definitely are. However, when you compare them to other NFL athletes, they're merely average. Take for example, Hall of Famer Tony Gonzalez. Tony is arguably the best tight end in NFL history, and he attempted a vegan diet. Within three weeks, he said that the 100 pound dumbbells I used to easily throw around felt like lead weights. I was scared out of my mind. And he is not the only one who may have suffered from going vegan. I can't say that the team featured in the documentary would perform better if they ate meat, but the documentary definitely cannot say that they're excelling because of their diet. Just like they can't say that the Olympic athletes excelled after going vegan. Dottie Bosch, the US Olympic cyclist, switched to a vegan diet and three years later won the US silver medal in cycling. This is the most impressive accomplishment of any vegan Olympian featured in this film. After switching to a vegan diet, Morgan Mitchell finished 24th in the women's 400 meters at the 2016 Olympics. Now, at age 25, she's retiring from the sport and opting for the longer distance 800 meters. Similarly, weightlifter Kendrick Ferris went vegan in 2014. In the 2016 Olympics, he finished in 11th place, 
lifting less weight at a heavier weight class than he did in the 2008 Olympics. You might be wondering, if the vegan diet is so helpful for performance, then where are all the vegan gold medalists? Well, there was one vegan gold medalist. Weightlifter Ilya Ilyin won two golds, which sounds like a huge win for veganism. Unfortunately, it was a bigger win for steroids. Something that is not uncommon for strength athletes. That's a steroid sport. I mean, yeah. it's just one of those sports where it's like bodybuilding. Pretty much everybody. It's a steroid sport. Mm -hmm. Patrick Baboumian is the epitome of vegan strength. However, the only thing that this portion of the documentary proves is that you don't actually need to eat mutton to get the world's best mutton chops. Although Wolveroid's feats of strength are undoubtedly impressive, they don't match up to the world's strongest men. Like Robert like, Oberst, the, you who had on the here. show. Yeah, the comparison between him and a guy like Oberst, it's not yeah, comparable. They're totally different. Well, let's compare. According to Wikipedia, Patrick has a bench press of 474 pounds compared to Robert's 650 pound bench. Patrick deadlifts 793 pounds and his squat is 815 pounds compared to Robert's 880 pound deadlift and 950 pound squat. That's about a 400 pound difference across just three lifts. And what does Robert eat? Lots of eggs. I'll do two of these for one lunch. Four of these, basically gonna take all of their pork, all this turkey. And this one will be my meat for the day. Patrick has some impressive records for a vegan strongman, but compared to Robert, whose best ever performance at the World's Strongest Man was eighth place, his numbers don't even register. It's like how vegan bodybuilder Nimai Delgado looks jacked, but this is another steroid sport, and when you compare him with other bodybuilders, you might ask if he even lifts. You don't even need to compare him with modern day bodybuilders to see the contrast. Arnold Schwarzenegger is featured as a vegan in this documentary. Assuming he is a vegan now, he definitely was not back in his championship days. But in these steroid sports, is it really surprising that the meat eaters became the biggest meatheads? What about sports where strength and muscle mass are less important? Vegan athlete Scott Jurek ran the Appalachian Trail in a record-breaking 46 days, 8 hours, and 7 minutes. I'm starting to think that the vegan diet might impair memory, because what they forget to mention is that Belgian dentist Carol Sabe beat Jurek's record by over 5 days while eating pizza and bacon. I should say he beat Joe McConaughey's record who beat Carl Meltzer's record, who beat Scott Jurek's record. While impressive, Jurek's accomplishment is not a compelling reason to drop meat. And neither is documentarian James Wilkes' performance on the battle ropes. James says that the best athletes at his gym can get about 10, maybe 20 minutes on the battle ropes. Even at the peak of my conditioning, the most I'd ever got was eight minutes. When James switches to a vegan diet, he crushes this time, only quitting because he got bored. I went past the hour mark by about one minute and just thought, all right, that'll do. Impressive. But as Joe points out, that all of a sudden he could do an hour and before he could only do 10 minutes. Well, I find that really hard to believe that you gained 50 minutes of your battle rope time. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt and say that he really did hit one hour. But is that because he switched to a vegan diet? Or is it because he had a career ending knee injury that forced him to focus on upper body endurance exercises? I once had a shoulder injury, and the time that I could run on a treadmill nearly tripled. It's not because shoulder injuries lead to better cardiovascular health, it's because I adjusted my workout program to accommodate for the injury by adding more cardio. People generally get better at the exercises that they perform regularly, and I would venture to guess that James' performance on the jump rope suffered just as much as his performance on the battle ropes improved. That's not to say that a vegan diet can't improve cardiovascular health. It just means that you can't say the improvement came solely because of the vegan diet. Just like you can't say that boxer Bryant Jennings' record improved because he went vegan. Unlike the first vegan fighter, Bryant Jennings appears to actually be a vegan. What they forget to mention in this case is that... In the uh, end of 13, 2013, he was 17 and 0 before he was vegan, and uh, he's, been so, he's 7 and 4 after that. This doesn't necessarily mean that he performed worse because of his diet. The argument against that would be that he's moving up into the upper echelons of the heavyweight division and it's filled with killers. Not most people that get up into that division, they start losing. Despite the record, I actually believe Brian when he says that his performance improved after going vegan. Because he says that when he was growing up... The only thing we knew was spinach and he can, collard greens, and Popeye's KFC, made by a frying chicken. And this gets to the heart of the issue. Switching from canned foods and fried chicken to quinoa and kale 
will probably make anyone healthier. That doesn't mean that if you add meat, it will make you feel worse. Heavyweight boxers like Deontay Wilder and Tyson Fury continue dominating the upper ranks while eating meat. So if you want to improve your athletic performance, can you switch to a vegan diet? This documentary shows that yes, clearly you can, but should you? The only way to really know is by measuring some performance metrics before starting the diet and continuing to monitor them once you begin. As you progress, try adding in meat and see if things change. You might be surprised to find out that adding meat to a whole food vegan diet actually improves performance. Or maybe not. In the new year, I'll be following a carnivore diet for three months while measuring my strength, body composition, blood panels, personality traits, and more so that I can get a holistic perspective of how this diet impacts me. If you want help setting up your own diet or workout experiment, check out my Wise Guides profile and I can give you a hand. But what if you're not concerned with athletic performance and follow a vegan diet for general health, environmental, or ethical reasons? I'm going to touch on each of these points in the following videos. If you love the Game Changers and don't want to hear contrary opinions, then you should unsubscribe from this channel. My goal is to give you a complete and unbiased perspective on different fitness plans. Until next time, get in the game and get after it.